Hi, my name is Tom Alston, and this is a first podcast for me, and I'm going to name this series of podcasts The Winning Pitch. I used that name for uh, a series of articles that I wrote for 11, 12 years for a collegiate baseball, which was a nationally published magazine for baseball coaches that went to high school and college baseball coaches, and I just liked the name, so I used it for my podcast. It's my intent to interview people who have done things successfully so that you can model, mimic, and master, and you can learn from them. So here we go, and uh, Dallas is going to uh, kind of conduct it, not kind of, I hate that kind of crap. It's like when and maybe bullshit. Ask the questions, hit me with them, little girl. Okay, so, um... The first question is, where are you from? Mars. <laughs> so the way I always answer it. I, it gets people's attention, and usually they remember me, and it's true. Uh, what was life like growing up? I've never grown up, and I refuse to grow up, because I've always thought growing up is someone else's definition of introverting me, so... I never grew up, but I was, this body was born in the Kaiser Permanente Hospital in Oakland, California on March 12th, 1948. If that's the way I can answer your question, if that works for you. Um, what were some of the key moments in your life that define who you are? It's a really interesting question. Um, I'm 72 years old currently, so I've had a lot of key moments. I wake up every morning thinking of myself completely unemployed, so I have to go out and find a new job every day. And that's more on the last 10, 15 years than on the first 10 or 15 years. I should have been looking for a job when I was in junior high school. Instead, I was looking for an easy way to get good grades and how to chase girls and hope they'd fall in love with me. Um, how did the health how did that help set you up to start your business? Well, that reminds me of things that I used to tell people. I used to be a district manager for Kmart Corporation for what was known as the Kmart Apparel Corporation. We land, we operated the uh, ladies departments and little girls departments inside of the Kmart stores. And I always used to tell people that whatever you used to attract someone from the opposite sex, the communication systems or particles or process or procedures or pattern, whatever you use, is the same way to talk to any other human being that you're trying to attract their attention and get them to do what you want to do. So um, that's probably the closest thing that I can say. Uh, you know, it's not a great way to actually duplicate things because in light of the Me Too, Me Too movement, it, it generally creates problems for you as a business owner these days if you're a guy. I don't know what, whether the Me Too movement creates any problems for you if you're a lady, but I have, I wasn't, I'm not one this lifetime. So, you know, it, uh, it's a pathway I use, a system that I use that, you know, uh, worked for me. Great. And what does your business do? Currently, the tax business, what we do is uh, we help people buy airplanes or boats or certain vehicles and legally avoid paying the California sales tax on them. And I'm going to use the word sales tax, even though that's a misnomer. I use it so that people will understand what I'm talking about, because most people in the industry misuse the term sales tax. In California, the taxes... Uh, ta Everything is a, I think type of a transaction tax is either a sales tax or a use tax. There's no legal way to avoid sales tax in California because by definition, a sales tax is a delivery inside of California out of the inventory of someone with a California seller spirit. So it's a very narrow definition. All other transactions, person to person, any deliveries outside of California, any of that kind of stuff turns it into a use tax transactions. And that is what we use is the use tax exemption process to help people pay zero. We've done over 1,700 of these cases and not one of our clients who hires us 
before they take possession and follows all our instructions has ever paid a dime in tax. So we're pretty good at what we do. And what are the topics that you're going to be going over in your podcast? Are you asking me what I'm going to do today or what I'm going to do in the future? No, it's, it's over your whole podcast. Like what are the, the main topics you'll be doing? So in the future, I hope to be interviewing people about their life and their processes and what they do that's been successful for them so that the people are listening to this podcast have something to model, mimic, and master. And I stole those three terms from Brandon Dawson of Cardone Ventures, and I think he stole them from John Maxwell. Of that, I can't, I'm not, I'm, it's just my memory. You turned your camera off or your microphone. Um, now you want to tie your business back to your why. The reason I'm in the tax business, the whole foundation of in the tax business is I'm naturally antithetical, and I'll even go so far as hate taxing agencies of any kind. And I'll tell you a story about that in a second. But especially in California, because I so totally disagree with the corrupt social socialist government that runs this state. So I'm against taxing agencies in general, and I don't like the, the course of political action and all of this funding and the way that money is spent by this state of California. So it is my, I take it as my duty to make sure that they receive as little money as possible. So that's my why for starting Aero Marine Tax Professionals. Oh, I was going to tell you the story of the why. Here's my, my motivation. And I've done videos on this, so you can go on YouTube or you can go anywhere on the internet and, and, and look it up, but I'll repeat it for you. When I was, I think, 13 years old, Christmas morning, and I was one of eight kids, I came down the stairs to where the Christmas tree, the room of the Christmas tree was in, and I noticed that there weren't any presents under it. And I go, what in the hell is going on? I later found out that my dad was in a dispute with the IRS over, I think the way that I remember the story of the dispute was that he had a business in Alaska. We moved down to California. And while we moved to California, my dad's partner ran off with all the money and left him with all the bills and all the uh, liabilities. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but that was my dad's story. So anyway, he's in this dispute with the IRS. Somewhere around the first part of December, the IRS person, I, I'll try not to use any really strong adjectives because we don't know each other well enough yet. As we do, you'll get, you get lots of my personal adjectives for those kind of people. Decided to go into his Christmas club account and took all the money out. So. It had to be embarrassing as hell for my parents because there's eight kids coming down the stairs. We come into the room where the Christmas tree's at and there's no presents, zero presents. My thought was, what the hell is going on? But I did notice hanging in the tree were these little tiny white envelopes. I thought, well, that's a weird kind of ornament. What my mom and dad have done is gone, they went through our list as kids that we gave them for all the things that we wanted. And we would generally list eight to 10 things. And it wasn't really so much that we expected, it, we actually wanted all the stuff on there and we were praying like hell and lighting candles at church and doing whatever believers do to get all of that stuff. And we were always disappointed if we didn't get it all, but I digress. I just was or thinking through the mind of a selfish 13 year old. So I, I look at this thing and I see all these white envelopes and I, op I opened one up that had my name on it and said, your uh, Christmas present will be here in a couple of weeks. I ordered you, a, I think it was, a, I was looking for a camera because at that particular point, I saw myself as someone who really wanted to learn about photography. So I'll, I'll go back to the tax story. My dad, father of eight kids, had his own business now again. Yes, he did at that point. In, in Sacramento, California, I don't feel like he was much of a flight risk. You know, you're not going to run away and hide with a family of 10. It's pretty damn hard to fight, to hide that group. You know, uh, 
it just, he wasn't going to do it. He was in constant communication with them and they went in and took the money anyway. I considered the guy that did that and I have made a decision for the rest of my life that it applies to everyone who works for any tax taxing agency. Even though I've met a lot of nice people that work for taxing agencies, this particular act was done by a gutless puke. And again, I modified that language for this podcast. Um, you know, it's, it's like, have anybody, do you ever remember when you were in high school, someone telling you that when they graduated from high school and then went to college, that it was their goal to become someone working for a taxing agency and going after all these vicious, evil taxpayers whose whole goal in life was to steal money from the government? Of course not. It doesn't happen. From my standpoint, you get out of high school, you have a little bit of interest in math. So you think, well, maybe that leads me to accounting and I'll learn how to use Excel cell spreadsheets. So you start in college and you're getting that degree. And as you go through it, you've never cross-checked yourself with what am I going to do when I get out of that, when out of college, get out of college with this accounting degree? Because why do I think that? Because most kids that I know never think beyond getting the college degree. They've been fed the bullshit that all you got to do is get a college degree and you're going to make more money. And it's not true. The highest paid people on the planet are all salespeople, every one of them, whether it's Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or uh, Elon Musk, any of those people, they're salespeople. And they all dropped out of college. I'm not sure about Elon, but I know that Gates did and uh, Jobs did. So anyway, uh, back to my story. So it's, as you're going through all of this stuff, you realize that you're getting a lot of bad data. And I'm fortunate enough to be part of a religion that deals with those kinds of things that have happened into the past. And so there's a process I w I've gone through known as false data stripping. And every time I looked at one of these statements that were my part of my programming or my operating basis and how I dealt with things, I found out that I got that information from my mother or my father. And it was dumb. It was, if I, I if I'd ever looked at those statements from a, a standpoint of logic or from a 40 year old perspective or a 50 year old perspective or a 60 year old perspective, I would have laughed at it. But here I was at 60 or 70 still operating off them. So, uh, you know, it's, it's all that process of, of wanting to get from A to Z and not knowing, worse than not knowing the steps, having bad steps, having bad information. So I, I'm really not sure how I got off on that tangent, but I'm really good at going off on tangents. In fact, I have a whole series of videos that I do called Tom's Tangent on my Instagram. So just go on to my Instagram and uh, we'll make sure that you get that. And on my, I think it's my homepage or whatever, it, whatever it's called, there's a bunch of little circles at the bottom and one of them is called Tom's Tangents. Click on them. You'll get a, there's several hundred of them. And you can just get my morning rant. And sometimes it's laced with foul language because I have a tendency to lace with foul language all day, every day. And I think it's funny. I think swearing is funny. In fact, the funniest video that I saw this morning was a dog and a deer talking to each other. And they were swearing, and it was funnier than hell. I've always thought that way. It used to shock my mom the way that I talked, so I know I didn't get that from her. And I'm not really sure where I got my bad language from because my dad hit me with a belt every time I used the words that I use every day now. So he didn't knock it out of me. I do remember that my mom used to make me sometimes put soap in my mouth, but I maybe that's why I don't like the smell of smoke, uh, soap. I would rather jump in a pool of fresh water or jump in a pool of clean water and wash it all off with, 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 with uh, hand towels and towels. And I don't like the smell of soap. And I, so that's probably why. Yes, my parents screwed me up. Yes, I probably did that to my kid too. Because I started raising kids before I learned about false data stripping. So I didn't know the harm I was creating. Is there anything else you'd like me to tell you, young lady? No, that, those are all the questions. You just want to thank everybody for coming to the podcast. 
Well, we've only been on for 10 minutes. I think we want to extend this out a little bit more. So, I agree. But, what else do you want to talk about? Um, me? Uh, boy, what am I willing to talk about? That's a better question. Not want to talk about. There you go. What are you? What am I willing to talk about? Um, I don't know. Have I ever told you that my my story about my first girlfriend? I remember getting on a bus in Fairbanks, Alaska, and I was I think in the first grade, and I was got on the bus and we were going to school. I went to I think the name of the school was Immaculate Conception. It was a Catholic grammar school, and the guy said, "Is Maggie your girlfriend?" A, I had never cleared the definition of girlfriend, and B, I had no idea who Maggie was. So he says, Maggie, back there, she says you're, she's your girlfriend. So I said, okay, it's my girlfriend. I should be sitting back with her. So I went to the back of the bus and sat down next to her. And I found out that she was telling people that I was her girlfriend. Now, at that exact moment, I remember having the sensation of this is the very first time I've ever met this girl. I know nothing about her, and I didn't know who she was. So I'm not really sure what happened in my life at that moment, but I know that she was telling people that she was my girlfriend. So I figured it must be that easy to get girlfriends, and maybe I'm so damn good looking that I attract them all. So I don't know really where that came from, but I remember that to this day. And it probably set me off on a bad course because – I've liked little girls ever since. And when I say little girls, I'm not talking about little girls. I'm just talking about somebody relative to my age, even though I'm married to a gorgeous blonde who's 17 years younger than me. But it's, you know, it, that, that part of my life always came real easy to me. And maybe this is what started me down that path. So that's, that's a life-changing moment. Whatever. What else is other? I remember, and I'm not going to put these chrono together for you chronologically because I don't, my mind doesn't work that way. I remember going to college and taking a math class. And I remember saying, I'm going to create a goal that I want to get an A in this class. I want to never do any homework and never take a test. So I did it. And I probably shouldn't tell you how I did it, but I will anyway. The teacher was a young lady who was in her very first year of teaching and she was right out of college. And I could tell that she was kind of a naturally introverted person. So I just treated her with social graces and was always nice to her and always had nice things to say to her. So I raised our affinity levels to getting to this point. And she accepted every excuse I ever gave her for not turning in the homework because I was nice about it. I stayed in communication with her about it. And, uh, she accepted that I didn't take the test because she didn't make me, so I didn't do it. And as I went through in life, that became my modus operandi. That made me a very glib student. But I discovered that I could affect people by merely communicating with them and treating them well. Why? Because on planet Earth, we're taught not to communicate with people. Your parents all tell you, don't talk to strangers. Well, your teacher's a stranger right up until the very first day that she meets you, and then she's no longer a stranger. So to that degree, I didn't do what my parents told me. But I discovered that just communicating with people and treating people with a lot of affinity allowed me to do things that I shouldn't have been able to do. So that was probably another bad lesson. <laughs> do I have any good lessons? I don't know yet. Uh, you know, it, it's life is fun. You know, it's my, my attitude towards everything is fuck it. You know, I'm going to try this. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to try something else till I get what I want. Because my whole goal in life is to do what I want, what I want and how I want it. And later on in life, I learned there was a piece of that that had been missing when I was young. I have to be, I have to keep my ethics in. I can't create harm for someone else. Doesn't mean I can't stop anybody. Doesn't mean I can't slow somebody else down. I don't want to harm them. And it's, you have to use your own definition of what that means. It's like, it's kind of like the commandment of thou shalt not kill, which is a, a wrong interpretation of the commandment because it was not thou shalt not kill. The actual commandment said thou shalt not murder because it's real hard to eat a steak if you don't kill a cow. Just saying. It's, if you think about these things logically, you'll understand that you probably know that the way that you're told things is bullshit. And 
It's just, I mean, I, I remember one day in, in uh, I was a junior in high school going to what was then called Bishop Armstrong High School. And the, 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 the particular Christian brother was talking about um, death in children and abortion. And I said, why are you against all of that? And he says, well, because it's murder. I said, why? Why do you think that? And he tells me because he believes that the, uh, the, the soul is present in the body at the moment of conception. I said, okay, so why don't you have a funeral procession for the remains of an abortion? He looks at me and goes, you need to go see the vice principal. Is that the only guy who can answer the question around here? And so I got in the lunch. <laughs> I mean, it, it seemed like a perfectly logical question to me. And, you know, I found out later that they actually do require some form of service over the remains of an abortion. Now, I suspect that that's probably not being followed, but who's it, who, who am I to ask? I just, because I know, of course I know that. It's a dumb rule, but it's just the way that I felt about it. I said, shit, if I, if I want to know something, I should ask. And I'd always ask those questions. In fact, when I later transferred, well, as a senior transferred to public school out of Christian Brothers, I actually got kicked out because I got, was going to get married because my girlfriend was pregnant. I didn't do what my dad said then either. I, you know, I, I remembered the, the, the teacher in one of the classes coming, he says, you've got to stop asking these questions. I said, why? He says, well, because there's girls in this class. That makes them feel bad. I says, I want to fucking know the answer. You're the teacher. So how am I supposed to find out the question? Tell all the girls to leave the room because Tom's getting ready to ask another stupid sex question? Makes no sense to me. You're supposed to be teaching me. So no. So I got in trouble for that. I will also tell you that I got in trouble for something else as a, as a senior in high school. When I was a senior in high school and I was giving the – the, the task of writing a senior thesis, and this was in January of 1966. I mean, so you just think about what was going on around that time. And so I decided that I'd write a story that was a basically, I was confessing to the crime of being the guy that shot John Kennedy. And I, I wrote it all out. And I had decided that the person who had actually paid me to do that was Lyndon Johnson. And so I wrote it all up and just off the top of my head, it all comes out because I'm fairly creative that way because I get tuned into the wavelength of what's really going on at planet earth, even at the young age of, what was I, 16 then? And so the teacher gave me an F on it, which meant I wasn't going to be able to graduate. And I said, why did you give me an F? Well, you can't do this preposterous stuff and you can't talk like this. And I said, look, you stupid motherfucker, <laughs> grade the story, not what the story's about. So I got him to raise it to a D so I could graduate. But it was, they wanted to throw me out of school because I had the audacity to suggest something that I personally, my knowingness tells me is pretty damn true. So, you know, that's, that's kind of who I am. And, you know, truthfully, everything is funny. The coronavirus is funny to me. Because when you think about who is really causing all of this, the dumb idiots have never looked back in history to discover that every great idea, every great religion, most great products come out of a period of government suppression or, or tough times, whatever you want to call them. It's usually caused by government stuff. So they're getting ready to create the next best thing. And I'm trying really hard to be part of that. I'm trying really hard to produce uh, a, a, a company that rolls out the other end of this going gangbusters and we're all exploding and everybody working for me is liking out, uh, making a lot of money and likes working here. Why? Well, because the idiots just created a, a terrible, terrible so so solution. Anybody who applies an economic solution to a health crisis, I think they're fucking evil. I just, you, you look at it, you go, why would you do that? Well, the why is they want government control. What they don't realize is they're, they're creating something great. And that greatness is going to push back against this suppressive government. So there, it's their fault. It's their fault that everybody's 
their life is going tough. And, you know, some great things are going to come out of this. What I like about it is it got me off my dead ass and put me into much more higher level of massive action, which I got from Grant. And he had been telling me for years. And it wasn't until the lockdown that I actually started doing it. So thank you very much, government SPs. Just thank you very much. You, you made me understand that I have a lot more energy at this age than I had 10 or 12 years ago. And the reason for that is I'd gotten complacent. So coronavirus, the lockdown has been another pivotal moment in my life. And it's, you know, people who were around me before that and around me afterwards saw me go from my natural, if you don't understand anything about R3 tests, I'm naturally an influencer. I don't like to be tough on people. I'll, I'll do it with humor. I'll confront you with what you're doing is dumb, but I try to do it with a smile on my face. And what I did was I realized that I needed to go into massive action. So I had to go to the other part of my personality, which is a driver, which is massive action, which is, you know, I'm going to do it my way or you get the hell out. And, you know, it's, it's caused a great deal of turnover in my company. And I think it will for years is minute that you realize that you're responsible for enforcing your culture. You're responsible for maintaining the standards for whatever your product or service is, and you have to be willing to do that. So I think I've answered your questions. Uh, you know, we're, we've got about, well, what are we, 20 minutes into this at this point? So anyway, I hope to have these kinds of conversations in the future with someone else. And if you're really good and you ask real nice, I'm going to have this same conversation with Dallas. So at some point, she's going to be my guest on one of these uh, podcasts called The Winning Pitch. So join us. And maybe if you're really lucky, we'll figure out how to live stream this over Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram simultaneously. And that's one of our goals. So if you know anything about how to do that, you need to contact me at 916-691-9192 and tell me all about it because I'm a very interested and willing to pay customer. So this is the ending of podcast number one.